Thank you so much to President McInnes and to Dr. Clark for framing our day. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers, Professors Kirsten Green and Anthony Dandridge for their lecture, Black Lives Matter at SUNY, Disrupting White Supremacy in the Classroom and on Campus. On behalf of the Stony Brook University Libraries, I wanna thank Kirsten and Anthony for generously sharing their time and expertise with us today. And I'd also like to thank Mona Ramonetti, the head of scholarly communication at the University Libraries for extending this invitation to our speakers. I have just a couple of logistics to share. You'll notice two options on your screen, a chat and a Q&A tool. So as your moderator, I will monitor both throughout the session, but we'll save all questions for the end. Questions are welcome via the Q&A tool throughout the presentation, but you can chat to panelists to get help with any technical issues and also use the chat for conversation among attendees. For the Q&A, we're going to use a strategy called progressive stacking. This is a technique intended to give marginalized voices a chance to speak, particularly in an environment where there is a dominant group. What this means is if you choose to self-identify as belonging to a marginalized group, especially a marginalized racial or ethnic group, and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment in chat, you can choose to include an asterisk at the start of your remark. As your moderator, I will compile questions and comments throughout the session and will prioritize those with an asterisk. You are of course not required to self-identify, it's just an option, and I will do my best to get to all the questions today. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Anthony Dandridge is a visiting lecturer in the Department of Black Studies at the State University of New York at New Paltz, the second oldest Black Studies department on the planet. An Afrocentrist that prioritizes the importance of cultural lenses when engaging phenomena, he has been teaching university courses on race and racism for 20 years, worked with incarcerated youth in the Don't Fall Down in the Hood program and incarcerated adults in the now international Inside Out Prison Exchange program, where college students go into prisons and participate in college courses for a semester with people behind walls. Recently, he is a founding member of the Black Lives Matter at School Collective at SUNY New Paltz, a co-chair of the SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective, a New Paltz Faculty Sustainability Fellow, an instructor of contemplative practices, a core member of the New Paltz Eddy, a steering group member for the Sojourner Truth Library Anti-Racist Campus Read, on several campus diversity committees, and a proud and active member of the Union of University Professionals, where he has presented on unions and racism on several occasions. Kirsten Green is an Associate Professor of Literacy Education at the State University of New York at New Paltz in the Department of Teaching and Learning, where they teach pre and in-service teachers how to teach reading, writing, and multimodal text production. Kirsten has been an anti-racist educator and union activist for the past 20 years in both K-12 and higher education, and is a founding member of the Black Lives Matter at School Collective at SUNY New Paltz. Their scholarship critically examines the disconnect between policy and practice in 21st century schooling. And when they're not teaching, reading, writing, protesting, or parenting, you can find them roller skating. Please, everyone, put your virtual hands together and welcome Anthony Dandridge and Kirsten Green. Peace, family. Peace, family. We're excited to be here today to share some of the story of our efforts at SUNY New Paltz related to the Black Lives Matter School. Um, here we have a map that outlines our plans for the next hour today. And although Claire did give us some introductions, we also did plan on adding to our introductions, just giving you guys a little bit more context as it relates to who we are. Um, again, as was said already, my name is Anthony Dandridge and my personal pronouns are he, him, his. A favorite phrase of mine is, I don't need to know you to love you. And I actually mean it. I'm a visiting instructor at the second oldest Black Studies Department on the planet at SUNY New Paltz. I started teaching as a graduate student at Temple University, where as an an undergraduate in the philosophy department, I was told that Africans do not philosophize. After a couple of years of study and bold engagement with my professors, they saw fit to offer me a position that was not even, that at that particular time, I was not even interested in. 
Uh, the email started, quote, we are making you an offer that you cannot refuse. And in the end, I found myself teaching African and African-American philosophy in the same classroom that my professor told me that African philosophy does not exist. Studying the Temple School of Africology and African American Studies, the first department on the planet to grant a doctoral degree in the field, I am an Afrocentrist. Thus, I center Afrocentrist institutionalized and popularized the term center, right? We use that a lot these days. Um, the experiences of people of African descent as active agents and participants in the world, as opposed to relegating them to the margins of white supremacist hegemonic European reality by undermining their agency and subsequently their humanity. Ultimately, in accordance with an Afrocentric paradigm of thought, I view education as inherently political and a tool for social change. My anti-racist work as teased out by my colleague from Temple University Department of Africology and African American Studies, Evan Kendi, who wrote the book of how to be an anti-racist compels me to recognize that quote, there is no neutrality in in the racism struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is not an in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism, end quote. And I would like to add, there's also a mask for power. I'm honored to be invited to discuss such important work of that as the Black Lives Matter School movement. Hi everyone, again, my name is Kirsten, my pronouns are she or they, and I'm an Associate Professor of Literacy Education in the Department of Teaching and Learning at SUNY New Paltz. And I'm excited to share that I was also just elected to be our next department chair starting in fall 2021. I started my teaching career as an elementary school teacher in New York City. I've been a union activist and co-conspirator in the struggle to end racism for the last 20 years. And my research explores 21st century schooling experiences at the intersection of teacher education, education technology, and abolitionist education. I'm also a parent of a kindergartner, and I want to be clear about my positionality from the start. I'm a white non-binary non human who sees my role as a teacher educator as inextricably linked to the work of anti-racism. And I also acknowledge that I will always have more to learn. While I have lots to say on the topic of Black Lives Matter at school after four years of sustained action, and I'm proud of my involvement in bringing the initiative to SUNY New Paltz, I'm also always thinking about the dual risks of performativity and saviorism in this white body. As Dr. Bettina Love writes, quote, anti-racist teaching is not just about acknowledging that racism exists, but consciously committing to the struggle of fighting for racial justice. Consistently showing up for anti-racist work is part of how I consciously commit to the struggle of fighting for racial justice on our campus today and every day. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm looking forward to spending this time with you. The SUNY New Paltz campus itself occupies the land of Bunsi Lenape people. And as Claire already shared, Stony Brook University occupies the land of, of the Setauket people. If you are not sure what indigenous lands you currently occupy, please consider using a native land mapping tool to learn about and acknowledge the land that you are on. We will add the link in the chat at the end of our present presentation. Name the land. As all human beings are descendants of those first peoples in Africa to populate this planet over 200,000 years ago, knowledge of this fact helps us all to understand our common ancestors, our common conditions as social beings and ultimately our common reality. Accordingly, all communities, without exception, in part owes its, owes its being, vivacity, and limitations to the extensive generations of ancestors that have contributed to our individual and communal lived realities. Throughout human history, this has in part been expressed as a series of relationships that have manifest themselves in this very moment, as all things one does and does not do. And I would like to repeat that again, as all things that one does and does not do impacts all others at all times. On this land, many were brought against their will. On this land, others came in search of opportunities. And on this land, still others have lived here as managers, cultivators, and cousins of the earth. Facts are not fake news. The truth both hurts and heals. But the well-being of any individual or community is in part rooted in self-reflection, critical thinking, and the establishment of solidarity across ethnicities, races, genders, sexual orientation, class, and even organizations. In many ways, solidarity is mutual respect. It's relational. I want to start by acknowledging what has been buried, by honoring the truth. Combined, we are standing on the ancestral lands of the Setauket and Munsi Lenape people. 
we pay respects to their ancestors, elders, youth, and unborn. Our gathering here today is in part due to the relationships we have to traditions of violence that unjustifiably have taken lives. We are participating in disrupting, displacing, and decentering these marginalizing lived realities of human beings. Your work and our work is also in part due to the efforts at truth telling with the intent of making uncomfortable spaces more, un more comfortable and co-creating liberational spaces by the amplification of voices, alignment of purpose and acknowledgement of difference. Never forget. Black Lives Matter School is an extension of the long traditions of struggle that people of African descent have participated in for thousands of years on the mother continent in Africa, which also extends through their enslavement and their landing here in America in 1619. From the institutional resistance of racism by the development of historical, historically black colleges and universities to the establishment of the educational and industrial training school for Negro girls by the master teacher, Mary McLeod Bethune, later to become Bethune Cookman College, who also was the founder of the National Council for Negro Women to the creation of critically reflective tools for intellectual resistance by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father, the father of Negro History Week, later to become Black History Month, and is publishing in 1933 of the book named, quote, The Miseducation of the Negro, end quote, to the creation of freedom schools as a way of subverting those specific practices that would specifically deny Black folk the curricular engagement of the Civil War, civics, and foreign languages. And in some cases, such as that in Virginia, states would shut down the entire school district as a way of resisting desegregation. As a national movement, Black Lives Matter at school compels individuals and institutions to have some genuine discussions around systemic racist policies and practices that have shaped our educational institutions and the future of our communities and nation by molding the minds of our youth. Yes, it takes a village to raise a child and racist institutions in that village will impact our youth in complex, but many times not so covert ways. Black Lives Matter School participates in disrupting racist educational and institutional norms in similar ways that the establishment of the first Black Studies Department in 1968 at San Francisco State University and the second Black Studies Department in 1969 at SUNY New Paltz have created space for Black folk to be able to contribute to this global marketplace of ideas and concepts, not necessarily or fully on their own terms, but intentionally as a means to engage the low enrollment of Black students, the disparate treatment of these students um, as they arrive on campus and humanity's understanding of itself in addition to many other issues. In many ways, as educational traditions of people of African descent are as long as the educational development of humanity as a whole, educational objectives were established in the movement. The Black Lives Matter at school movement established its grounds of relevance when four demands were created. N zero tolerance, discipline, and replace it with restorative justice, implement black studies and ethnic studies, fund counselors, not cops, and hire more black teachers. Eventually, there were 13 principles that were created as valuable objectives for the movement. The 13 principles were initially developed by the Black Lives Matter Global Network and were mapped onto the Black Lives Matter School Week of Action by educators in Philadelphia, from the book and the text, Jesse Hagopian mentioned, quote, it should be noted that Black Lives Matter at school is not formally affiliated with Black Lives Matter Global Network or any other organization in the movement for Black Lives who have done so much important work towards ending police violence, but the educators who built Black Lives Matter at school have relied on the momentum of those organizations and know that there can be no real education if students are not allowed to discuss police violence and other issues that matter most to them, end quote. These 13 principles are rooted in the amplification of the better interests of the Black community. The Black Lives Matter at School movement began in the fall of 2016 in Seattle at John Muir Elementary School, when teachers organized to take a stand in solidarity with the, Black, the, with the movement for Black Lives and wear shirts to school that said Black Lives Matter at school. As news of the action spread, the school was met by a bomb threat. But instead of deterring the faculty from gathering, the bomb threat had the opposite effect. And some 3,000 teachers across the city of Seattle showed up to work wearing Black Lives Matter at School t-shirts. 
From there, teachers in Rochester, New York planned a similar day of action and teachers in Philadelphia implemented the first Black Lives Matter at School week of action and worked to break down those 13 principles across the first week of February in 2017 and began to develop a curriculum which is now available for free on the national website. Weeks of action took off from there across the country in 2018 and 2019. And in the 2020-2021 school year, the National Steering Committee launched the Black Lives Matter at School Year of Purpose. The following video speaks to what the movement hopes to expose, create, and achieve. What is happening in our schools today? is heartbreaking. This is one of the racist rants discovered Monday at Oak Park River Forest High School. Our kids are being called the N-word. We have white students who think it's okay to come to school for Halloween with a KKK mask. 1.6 million children in this country go to a school where there's a police officer but no counselor. Educators in Washington State are 90% white. I'm not getting the education that I need as a black male. The people who have done the conquering have been the ones that we've been lauding in school. Kobe, who's in the ninth grade at Pearland High School, was studying immigration when he read this in his textbook, a comment that referenced African slaves as workers. All I ever see is us being slaves, you know? Like, why don't you ever teach me, you know, how we fought back? Because I know my people are strong. A referee at a high school wrestling match in New Jersey told a wrestler he had to cut his dreadlocks or forfeit the match. I see people around me who are hurt, and it is wrong to not speak up. Black Lives Matter at School is a declaration that black students deserve to be taught the truth and that their lives have value. It gives um, students, not, not only of color, but of other races and ethnicities, a chance to see different cultures. We have lessons for every single day, Monday through Friday. So there's about two to three principles per day that are connected. We participated in this last year, and a lot of feedback we got from educators who have never really experienced ethnic studies in the classroom was that their students were more engaged in this content than they, than they had ever seen before. I learned so much, so much through that, that really empowered me as a black man. This is probably the first time I really was excited about school. You know, it's something that I'm passionate about now. <laughs> Here we go. So having, been, uh, having followed the National Black Lives Matter at School initiative from its inception, I noticed a lack of involvement from colleges of education. That made sense in some ways since the movement was initiated by K-12 educators, but teacher prep programs housed inside colleges of education are a literal bridge between institutions of higher ed and the K-12 sector. So when I realized that the 2018 National Black Lives Matter at School Week um, coincided with a SUNY New Paltz School of Education faculty meeting, I helped organize a few faculty members to wear Black Lives Matter at School shirts on that day. The following fall, I co-founded the SUNY New Paltz Critical Pedagogy Study Group with Dr. Michael Smith, who's now at the College of New Jersey. And we met monthly to read, write, and think together about the application of critical pedagogy in our daily work. Although Crit Ped started in the School of Education, it quickly spread across campus and became the beginning of a fast friendship and activist partnership between me and Anthony. The Critical Pedagogy Study Group planned three events that aligned with the national 2019 Black Lives Matter at School Weeks of Action. We had limited attendance at those events, though the discussions were fruitful. The following year, we made a strategic decision to reach out to the Faculty Development Center to see if partnering with our official space for professional learning on campus would have a different impact than our previous ad hoc approach. We were able to engage more than 850 people in our campus community across 13 planned events. However, we were challenged by and continue to be challenged by the possibility of having our truly grassroots efforts subsumed by the larger institutional structures that exist. We planned two weeks of action this year too and had about 650 participants across 11 events. Anthony will say a little bit more in detail about the events in a little bit. The planning process across these four years was not smooth sailing. It was messy and fraught and we made plenty of mistakes in the process, but we also learned valuable lessons one important lesson that we learned and are still figuring out 
is that centering black voices at a predominantly white institution is no easy task. Most black faculty are completely tapped out. They're asked to serve on more, committee, on more committees than anyone else and offer hours of invisible labor mentoring students of color. Another lesson, <clears throat> excuse me, that we learned is that simply asking rather than asking for permission works sometimes. For instance, we had this vision that we'd fill the stairwell of one of our buildings with students, staff, and faculty wearing Black Lives Matter at school t-shirts. But buying t-shirts is expensive and we didn't wanna make people purchase them if we could avoid it. So we approached the Department of Student Affairs and the New York, United, New York State United Teachers Union and together they funded the production of over 1,500 shirts that were given away at events across our weeks of action. Another lesson that we learned is that collective leadership is hard, but worth it. We navigated a number of ideas and ultimately felt that spreading our events across two weeks instead of one was necessary. What emerged from the 2020 and 2021 weeks of action was a core group of organizers willing to dedicate their energy and resources to move the needle at our institution in support of Black Lives. Anthony will now share a little bit more about the details of some of those events. And I'm not gonna get into all of the events, but um, the 2020 Weeks of Action was a watershed event for us as an organization. Uh, we had groups of faculty members, students, alumni, community members, and even administration coming together for the first time underneath the umbrella of Black Lives Matter School Collective to engage issues of race and racism on campus. It was amazing that we were able to coordinate all of these individuals and groups. The series of events started with me, a faculty member in the Department of Black Studies, facilitating a panel named Black Struggle for Justice at SUNY New Paltz, Past, Present, and Future. We had former faculty members from the Department of Black Studies and students from the 1960s on stage with current faculty members in the department and students, including members of the Black Student Union. They were building bridges as elders spoke about their struggles, survival tools, and our youth engaged them about similarities and, dif and differences on campus. Um, where in the end, the similarities of the struggles dominated the conversations. And another event that we had also was the In Here, Out of Here, Their event, which was facilitated by myself and two colleagues, Terry Murray and Chris Whitaker, as we run a faculty and staff contemplative group that meets bi-weekly on campus. In this event designed for Black Lives Matter at school, we engage issues of contemplative practices as tools for healing and deeper appreciation that included the complexities of silence. Martin Luther King said that in the end, you will not remember the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. And that leads to uh, revealing our connections towards a greater sense of empathy. Crucial to the visibility of and connection to the educational foundation of our everyday work at SUNY New Paltz during the weeks of action was the involvement of the Sojourner Truth Library, our campus library, and especially Jennifer Rutner, who curated and developed a publicly available research guide that built on the resources gathered by the Critical Pedagogy Study Group. The lobby to our library also housed a beautiful and moving exhibit in the week of Weeks of Action 2020 that featured student artwork related to the movement for Black Lives. In the summer of 2020, the murder of George Floyd. In terms of the role of the of a significantly racist police state is not unlike the murder of Rashad Brooks is not unlike the murder of Daniel Prude is not unlike the murder of Breonna Taylor is not unlike the murder of Atiana Jefferson, Aurora uh, Rosser, Stefan Clark, Botham Jean, Philandro Castillo, Alton Sterling, Michelle Cusack, Freddie Gray, Tanisha Fonville, Eric Gardner, Akai Girl, Gabriella Navarez, Tamir Rice. Michael Brown, Tanisha Anderson, Walter Scott, or so many others, including a SUNY Duchess student who was murdered two days before the murder of George Floyd. His name is Maurice Gordon, and he was, an un, he, and he was unarmed and killed by a New Jersey State Police Trooper on May 23rd of last year. We are living in a significantly large shadow of the murder of George Floyd. As we can as we currently sit here, there is a trial being held to establish the justification or unjustification of the stolen life of George Floyd. 
coalescing of events happened to justifiably amplify the loss of his life where so many other lost lives are erased due to the lack of not just public outrage, but a lack of a global outrage, the pandemic, and what I would like to describe as a quieting of the planet, where for better or worse, um, families were forced to sit and see one another because of the ongoing changes in their schedules due to a somewhat healthy fear of COVID. This, this disruption in our daily lives compelled many to watch the tragic erasure of a man's life. The disruption of our daily lives opened up spaces for activism when otherwise people may have had to work. This disruption of our daily lives allowed the planet to breathe in that nitrogen oxide levels dipped by 20% globally, 60% in Milan, and 40% in New York. This disruption in our daily lives compelled us to heal, seek justice, and expand equity. Kirsten and I were just asked by the administration less than 48 hours ago if we had anything planned for the end of the George Floyd trial. A great idea as reflecting on it and realizing that we have a full plate of activity on other issues. It's more work. A wise man by the name of Dr. Malefi Asante once told me that if you see a problem, you've created a job for yourself. Black Lives Matter was everywhere. A global phenomenon that not only had its name written on many streets in this nation, but it was being chanted and displayed in London, France, Canada, Ghana, and many other spaces, ultimately leading to the announcement in February that Black Lives Matter was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Still, there's work to be done. So during the summer of 2020, Black Lives Matter School held an event of, of intersections of racism and the pandemic of which I participated in. Also that summer, the formation of an organization of which I am co-chair named the SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective had commenced. The SUNY Black Faculty and Staff was galvanized by the efforts of Professor Jordan Bell and Professor Willie Morris of SUNY Duchess, in part to bring awareness to the death of Maurice Gordon and the inadequate attention to his death by SUNY. Currently, the family has filed a $50 million lawsuit against the New Jersey State Police. The mission statement of the SUNY Black Faculty and Staff states, we, the SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective have formed to support Black students, faculty, and staff of SUNY campuses and beyond. Moreover, we are committed to transforming SUNY into an anti-racist structure. The SUNY Black Faculty and Staff Collective seeks to make meaningful institutional changes by advocating for, aiding in the implementation of, and coordinating such activities that support Black students, staff, faculty, and faculty across SUNY's campuses. The collective stands independent from, but in support of, offices of diversity and inclusion as a faculty, staff, and student-led effort to for concrete change for racial justice in SUNY. We have 11 advocacy points stated on our website, and we have had uh, meaningful and productive conversations with the outgoing chancellor and now president of of Ohio State, Christina Johnson, in addition to our newly elected chancellor, Jim Malatris. The activism of this summer also galvanized SUNY New Pulse alumni to serve the administration with a list of demands where over 1,200 people signed to support. Another summer event was the STEM faculty uh, in um, Black Lives Matter School organization. They organized programs and discussions with STEM students and faculty. There was also uh, multiple campus town halls being held by the campus administration. And as a result of the engagement and suggestion of Kirsten and myself at one of those events, the campus released a statement of commitment to become an anti-racist institution. As we approached the past, this past fall, we, determined to, we were determined to align our series of campus events with the National Black Lives Matter at School Year of Purpose, which mapped the 13 principles across the academic year. But like so many, many of us, we also suffered from Zoom fatigue and the uptick in labor that from having to move coursework fully online for almost an entire year. Several collective members broke off to join other anti-racist initiatives on campus or stopped attending meetings altogether, disillusioned by the slow pace of change and what felt like empty promises. However, we pulled off a two full weeks of programming again in February, 2021, that included film screenings, panel discussions, community conversations, lectures, and a book reading. Although we felt the loss of not being able to gather together in the same room because of necessary physical distancing restrictions, the series of events created much needed spaces for doing some of the intellectual labor of actively centering Black voices. We're currently planning for summer programming and intend in the 2021-2022 school year to finally plan our year of purpose. 
We're holding a general interest meeting next week in which we hope to recruit more members to the collective and begin plans for the summer and next year. In early 2020, we found that the Black Lives Matter school effort at SUNY New Paltz was the largest involvement of any institution of higher education that had pledged its commitment to the movement. And we then had the privilege of being invited for an interview to be included in the book, Black Lives Matter at School, an uprising for educational justice edited by Jesse Hagopian and Denisha Jones. We were interviewed in February of 2020, just as our weeks of action were kicking off and about three weeks before the global shutdown due to COVID-19. In the chapter, we share our plans and lessons learned from 2019. And if we could do the same thing now, we'd have so much more to say. Our events in 2020 weeks of action moved the conversation forward on our campus and sustained and the sustained uprising for Black Lives in summer of 2020 created a shift in the dialogue at the national even at the national level. Having had the chance to contribute to this text provided the opportunity to say that institutions of higher education need to examine their curriculum and pedagogy just as much as the K-12 schools need to. So the book is organized into four main sections and just being sensitive to the time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, um, but highly, highly recommend. It is um, all of my, the chapters as I've read through it are just marked up in the margins. There's so much to learn from this book. Um, and there are voices included from across schooling um, spectrum, including students in the last section, which is particularly point, uh, poignant. Um, and of course we would, we would say, so, Here's the, sorry, quote, <laughs> the Black Lives Matter at School movement is the story of resistance to racist curriculums, educational practice, and policies. And this is directly from the text. This is the story of educators, students, parents, and community members defying the threats of white supremacists and the story of an uprising to, the, to uproot the racist policies and curriculum that are bound up in the American system of schooling. In short, this is the story of bold action against anti-Blackness in elementary schools junior highs and high schools around the country. And of course, we would add higher education to that list. So we highly recommend and we will add a chat, um, a link in the chat uh, to where you can purchase the text. And in the last portion of our presentation, we'd like to talk more about how the SUNY system itself is complicit in upholding white supremacy and what are some of the things we could do about it. There are numerous ways that SUNY upholds white supremacy. And the most primary way is being an institution of education and a racial, capitalist society that puts profits before people. To be clear, we aren't arguing that SUNY is inherently bad. However, we are arguing that by virtue of existing in society that has a vice grip on whiteness, it is reproducing it by default unless it is vigilantly examining and questioning its positionality and how it wields its power at all times. Beyond its sheer existence as an institution of higher education, SUNY's complicity in reproducing whiteness shows up in its diversity work. Again, not all diversity initiatives are inherently bad or unproductive, but many of them are arguably about making the system look less racist rather than actually undoing racism. And we've seen this very phenomenon unfold numerous times on our campus. For instance, when black students, alumni, staff, and faculty have raised not feeling seen or heard or expressed frustrating at being tokenized or isolated, the administration's response has largely been to point out how many faculty of color were hired in the previous round of searches or when discovered uh, when we discovered a Blue Lives Matter sticker on the university police door, we were able to get it removed. But the conversation happened to be in a closed door setting. And instead of turning the incident into a learning opportunity, it was quietly moved on from as soon um, as the sticker came down. When our campus administration proposed an initiative called the First Amendment Support Team or FAST, a group of people comprised of plain clothes, university police department officers and appointed faculty and staff who would be deployed to surveil and potentially interrupt protect activity on campus. Right? Our collective wrote a statement in opposition, which quickly gained over 150 signatures of support and led to the indefinite postponement of FAST. While the recent hires of Black faculty members are certainly a step in the right direction, SUNY's record on retention of Black faculty is abysmal, and numbers are meaningless if the qualitative experience of Black faculty members prevents them from staying at SUNY. Mm -hmm. According to a 2017 report on gender and racial equity throughout the SUNY system, only 19 Black faculty members reached tenure in the 20 years spanning the 1995-96 and 2015-2016 school years. That is less than one faculty member per campus and on average less than one per year. 
We point to these examples, not to shame our campus or any other campuses within the SUNY system that might be implementing similar practices. Indeed, our workplaces are our collective homes away from home. On the contrary, we aim to shine a light on the way SUNY embodies what Sarah Ahmed captures in the scholarship on the slipperiness <clears throat> of diversity work in institutions of higher education. Ahmed writes, quote, diversity work becomes about generating the right image and correcting the wrong. Diversity becomes about changing perceptions of whiteness rather than changing the whiteness of organizations. Changing perceptions of whiteness can be how an institution can reproduce whiteness as that which exists, but is no longer perceived." End quote. So this photo is a, a fraught example of what we're talking about. While the photograph represents an undeniable groundswell in discussion at the intersection of anti-Black racism and education on our campus, it also became an image that got symbolically repo reposted and repurposed as false evidence of our campus's anti-racist efforts. In other words, this photograph and what it represents may help change the perception of whiteness at SUNY New Paltz, but it does not change the whiteness of our campus. While we stand by the efforts of the Black Lives Matter at School Collective, we are undeniably wrestling with how one, in, how institution, how one institutionalizes anti-racism or if it can even happen when the institution itself is racist. So what can we do to disrupt the constant recentering of whiteness that is embodied in everyday policies and practices assumed. The lessons of Black Lives Matter School when it comes to disrupting white supremacy are many, and institutions of higher education have a lot to learn from what students, teachers, parents, and community members did and are still doing in the K-12 sector that have taken on this work. We need not only hire more Black faculty, but we need to make SUNYs <clears throat> But we need to make SUNY a place where Black faculty feel welcome, where Black faculty feel protected, where Black faculty feel connected. We also need to reckon with the curriculum in order to examine the ways in which Black voices and scholars are silenced, marginalized, or erased through the content of what we teach. We need to mandate Black studies. We also need to examine our pedagogy. Implicit bias or unintended racism in the classroom can be incredibly harmful and it happens every single day on every single campus and it often goes on uninterrupted. Engaging in community readings and viewings and other activities that promote not only thinking but action are important. As our forming cross program, cross department, cross school partnerships. So much of this work it's about building relationships and cutting against the isolation and divisiveness engendered by academic institutions, policies, and practices. We need to disarm the university police and rethink the purpose of policing on campuses in the first place. These kinds of arguments have been going on within these institutions of higher education since the 1960s. Funding is key. After submitting a request to the central administration for funding to support the Black Lives Matter at School Collective, we received $15,000 in funds spread across three years. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a start and every campus should provide the same and more. Connect with your local UUP chapter. Unions, yeah. <laughs> the SUNY Black faculty and staff collective, come on down, come on down. Uh, and the surrounding community of your campus. Without connecting efforts across space and time, we may continue spinning our wheels. And perhaps most importantly, we need to get much, much better at acknowledging that institutions of higher education are by their very existence, tools of white supremacy. Black students, alumni, staff, and faculty have been saying that SUNY causes harm to black people for years. It's time that the institution not only listens, but responds in a way that doesn't simply reproduce whiteness. And we would like to thank you for this opportunity to share space and time with you today. Um, a special thank goes to Claire Payne, Stacey Hearth, uh, Mona Romanetti, Pat Hines, and everyone else involved in making today happen. We want to give a shout out to Anthony Reed, the SUNY New Paul student who designed the Black Lives Matter in School logo for our campus. Lastly, we'd like to share this poignant Google ad as Dr. Bonetta Love did in a recent talk not as an endorsement of Google, but as a reminder that Black history is everywhere around us. It is in the air we breathe, and yet it gets erased by 
everyday practices of schooling. It's about time that it shows up in the classroom's front and center. Thank you. We now look forward to hearing from you during the time that we have that. I'm telling y'all ready. But just like life. All right. Air Jordan ready to take off. Sorry, it's gonna play again. <laughs> oh my gosh, sorry, I'm gonna mute myself. This is too funny. <laughs> Thank you both so much for sharing those insights and energizing us this morning with um, information about what you've been able to accomplish at, at New Pulse. I think it's really wonderful. Um, we have a lot of wonderful comments um, coming in through the chat. People saying, thank you so much. Really appreciated starting my day on this call. Fantastic presentation. So lots of, lots of love coming in through there. Um, and we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so I'll start with this one. Um, from Mila Sue, it says, you all have been doing some great work. Can you speak to working with your DEI office? I'll let Kirsten handle that one. <laughs> so um, as I'm sure is similar across most campuses, um, the DEI office represents the institution first. And, I, and so I think one of the, the benefits of having established this coalition, this collective that, that we've established is that we, um, as a union leader once told me, when the leadership is doing what's right, you work with them. And when they're not, you try for a workaround. And so um, it has not always been the easiest. Um, I think sometimes we hear the message, not, not now, not right, you know, not at this time. Um, and I think the forming the collective has allowed us a space and a platform to say, no, absolutely right now, we, we can't wait anymore. Um, so I'm not sure that's that much detail, but um, it's been fraught. Thanks, Anthony, did you want to add anything? Or are we good to? Uh, no, no, not really. Just, I mean, those tensions exist with respect to any organizations. And, and, and us having a grassroots organization, it allows us the space to be a little bit more freer and also make connections um, not only across campus outside of interacting um, with, with the administration, but also out, um, outside of the uh, campus community to other communities as well. And as we tie into that, become you get a not only a um, the ability and power to interact with other groups, but also you gain a sense of legitimacy. And with respect to that legitimacy, you also gain, you know, that sense of power that can be used as a balancing act in many ways in terms of um, getting things done on campus and engaging the um, administration with respect to the, the power that they wield as, as um, also. Thank you. Um, we have another question. This one says, how would you combat disingenuous diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts? Efforts that stop short of any real action while promoting DEI and condemning white supremacy in name only. Well, um, uh, initially, uh, start your own stuff. Do your own stuff. Um, as I said in the presentation, um, 
I have a, um, a mentor of mine, Dr. Malefi Asante, and he told me 20 years ago, um, Anthony, when you see a problem, you've created a job for yourself. And I like to say that a lot of time. Kirsten hears me say it all the time. And um, it can be daunting because now there are a lot of problems that exist out there. But it's important for us to understand that if you don't get involved and you don't seek to bring about change with respect to those particular problems, in a lot of ways, you're complicit. Right, and, and that's when we start talking about what anti-racist um, uh, anti work is about. We start to understand our connections to these outcomes and, and understanding that um, we are in part responsibility. We are in part responsible for those outcomes, whether they are positive or negative, right? And that's how complicity works. Um, Kirsten, did you wanna add anything else? I think you nailed it. Um, and I think just an example from our campus is the, the biggest thing that the Diversity and Inclusion Council on our campus um, has done is significant and yet at this point dated, um, which has been the, the name changes of um, residential halls on our campus, which were also, most of which were named after local slave owners um, until the, I think two years ago, the change happened. And so not a whole lot has come out of the council since that time and a whole lot has happened in our society. So um, I agree with Anthony, sometimes you have to make your own pathways and bring your friends together. Um, we certainly learned that going individually into the administration's um, office doesn't always amount to much. Um, collective action works. And I would also like to let, add that, um, this is something I always like to say, that um, there are no perfect individuals, there are no perfect institutions, and there are no perfect ideas. So as, as we engage different things, we understand that um, not everybody or not all individuals or institutions, uh, let's say the administration or um, the, 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 the DNI um, um, initiatives can, can do all things for all people, right? Um, but the things that they do and they don't do impacts all people. And that's when you got you need to come in and push them a little bit more, or, or even if it's just create your own organization, maybe that's the strategy or route that you need to take. Thank you. Um, we have a connect a question that I think is is a little bit related there too. So um, this person asks, I'd love to hear more about how to examine our curriculum and pedagogy, best practices, principles, resources, etc. Um, so a broad question there, but feel free to, to go in whichever direction um, makes sure. sense to y'all. So in educational leadership, which I'm not an expert in, um, I have never been a principal or superintendent or, uh, well, I'm about to hold a leadership position. So I guess the, the, the learning curve will be steep for me, but um, there is something called an equity audit, which is an activity where you essentially look for where power lies within um, an educational space. So it can be applied to a school building. It can be applied to a unit of study. It can be applied to a classroom. Um, so using a tool like an equity audit is a great place to start. Um, we planned to do something like that this year and we didn't end up doing it, but we were thinking of holding like a, um, a series of one day workshops um, and engaging the help of the library where we begin to examine what actually shows up, whose voices are being amplified in, in the assignments and in the readings and viewings that are assigned by uh, professors. And so, um, you know, it's not easy work. It's, it's, it has to be revised repeatedly. Um, but hopefully that helps give some ideas about where to start and how to start that project. Very important. Um, this question I think connects to what you just mentioned libraries there. Um, this person asks, what would you like to see libraries doing more of or less of? Well, that's a good question. Well, one thing that I would like to see libraries doing more of and what is actually happening on our campus is just providing resources for students that are free, right? right? De just developing those resources. So because um, uh, with respect to particularly marginalized populations and those limits, those financial limits that they, um, that they have as they walk through the world, um, the price, the, those problems associated with them just getting access to books is, is a significant cause for them. And so just providing those um, resources that are, that they can get access to, whether it's a physical book, you know, electronic copy and other things for students. And I think that libraries are actually moving in that direction and SUNY is moving that direction with um, OER and a variety of di different other things. But um, I think that that is one, uh, one thing in particular that libraries should be focusing on. Absolutely. and. 
our campus just went through, um, you know, in many ways, the library is the heart of, of learning on any given campus. Um, and our, our library just initiated, and Anthony was actually on the steering committee for this, um, an anti-racist campus read. Um, and through the course of four meetings, we ended up having, it was like a mini course um, that anyone on campus could participate in. Um, I'd love to see that happen again and again, and not just as sort of an isolated, you know, one-off incident, but something that builds over years and allows an opportunity for incorporating some of those readings and activities in courses um, in really explicit ways. And this was centered um, um, within the library. And um, at the end of the day, students actually, it, we have faculty members, students, and administrators participating in these book reads over a four week period. And we have made a three year commitment to doing this year after year as, as we go forward. So, you know, things like that can be particularly helpful. I'm just gonna, we have a bunch of questions coming in, so I will keep throwing them Sorry, at you. we went long too. No, no, it was wonderful. Um, this person asks, what suggestions can you make for leadership on campuses who choose to remain silent in light of events, such as the George Floyd movement or stopping AAPI hate? I mean, I think one thing that we can look to is, is our students. Our students are hungry for direction and for leadership to stand up and say, this is not right what's happening right now. And so there is no one way to get people who choose to be silent to speak up. But I do think that um, engaging the, engaging students in dialogue is one way that, that helps move the conversation along. You can't deny when students are speaking out at a forum or at a teach-in or in any other way um, that something needs to be said. And so um, I did see a question in the chat, are students a part of the Black Lives Matter at School Collective? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say it's, it's been a challenge to, to find the continuity year to year because students do end up leaving campus. And of course there are a million competing interests um, and scheduling and all of that. But without our students involved in the collective, it, it wouldn't be worth, um, it, it would absolutely be worth it. <laughs> Let me not say that, but it would not be, have the same impact on our campus community because um, we're all here for our students at the end of the day. And also as students um, seek to become uh, more active on campus in terms of engaging um, their own interests and in, even when it comes to them having to call on the administration to, you know, to do certain things. Um, you we as faculty members not only need to support them, but then there's always a balance with respect to having to stay out of their way too. Right, right. Um, so you, you, you tend to want to stay out of their way, let them do their own thing, but when they have the events show up. And say, listen, I support you. I support you guys. And that helps them. That gives them a sense of agency and agency and power that they don't necessarily have in other spaces. Thank you. Um, this person asks, how could you navigate becoming the token person of color in your area? How can you feel empowered as you try to inspire change while seeing insufficient change? Well, um, demographics really compels tokenism in a variety of different ways, right? If they are not, if if you are one of few people, whether you know a few black, few individuals who identify in the way that you identify in any group, in some sense that tokenism is going to express itself just in terms of you become becoming an active member, right? So that is an issue that presents itself. Um, uh, even me myself on campus, I mean, there are not there are not a lot of uh, uh, black folk. On, on campus at SUNY New Pulse, right? And then also, so you get pulled in a variety of different um, directions. Um, I'm probably on about, I literally am on about eight committees right now on campus, right, right? And and just doing doing so much, so much, so much kind of work. And in some sense, it can feel like levels of tokenism, but then understand that an issue of perspective, right? So is it tokenism, but then also are you breaking barriers, right? And how can that barrier breaking be viewed as a thing for opening up doors for other individuals to come in? So it's always this balance with respect to your own perspective and you know, engaging those things, but it's still complicated just in terms of the ways and that, that can also weigh on your spirit in a variety of different ways too. Um, this is, I think, a, a related question. How do you suggest dealing with sexism and bullying from alleged allies in the movement? 
some spaces where DE&I work is being done, we can't walk away from. I think part of what we have to do is we have to set um, norms and practices at the start of every meeting. It's something that we, we actually haven't been doing recently. We've had the same people sort of showing up at our meetings, but for the first couple of years, we, we have a, a set of reminders about what, much like Claire did at the beginning of this talk, like we have a, a set of non-negotiable behaviors. Um, thankfully, we haven't had to, to really deal with anything. Um, actually, I'm not sure, we haven't had to deal with anything that's come up where people have been asked, you know, we haven't asked anyone to leave the group or anything like that. But I think being really explicit about what's happening and what is not at all going to be tolerated is really important. And then developing a network. Um, we do have an anti-bias um, team that started on our campus and was part of the one of the requests that that black alumni put forward and then we helped um, propel forward in the conversation and that's where the fast initiative that we talked about um, during the presentation came out of and we were able to push back at that and say no that's not that's not what we meant right by by creating a system of accountability so um there are ways to to make sure that um people are not surveilling, but paying attention to, and then prepared to intervene um, in ways that are that can be productive and mitigate any harm that might happen. Um, that's a really hard one. It, it it happens all the time, certainly. And also, um, to complement that is just you know just building a critical mass of like-minded individuals, right? Um, so you have that. I mean, um, it's it's hard to it's, it's hard to come into a space and start bullying right right when you're outnumbered. <laughs> I'm not saying that doesn't happen. We understand how it happens, right right right. But that's something you take in, in, into consideration. Building those networks, um, bringing people into your group, and just um, being particularly intentional, as Kirsten was talking about, as 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 it relates to uh, what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Thank you. Um, there was one question I saw in the chat. Um, what have you seen as some of the more successful strategies in recruiting, retaining, and graduating Black undergraduate students in programs with predominantly white students? Oof, I would say that that's something our campus is still very much working on, especially as I speak from um, a school of education that is predominantly white, um, more so than the rest of campus. Um, it's been a challenge. I've, I've heard of students taking classes um, in education, being interested in majoring in education and then deciding not to because they didn't see any black professors, they didn't see enough black classmates. Um, so that's something that I think every institution across SUNY probably needs to reckon with right now and figure out. Um, I, I don't know that there's any one answer, but it's something that needs to be talked about um, and attended to immediately. And also helping to um, helping students to develop their own, let's say, affinity groups where though they feel supported by one another. I think that that's particularly important. We do have this program on campus called the Scholars Mentorship Program. It is doing phenomenal things, right? And is actually looked at as a model uh, nationally in terms of its ability not only to retain but also graduate those um, uh, uh, black and brown folk that are actually part of the scholars mentorship program. So, I mean, just, just developing those groups, um, those support systems to where as, uh, people feel connected um, as ways to combat that isolation that comes when um, you're, you're uh, uh, a demographic minority in a variety of different spaces. Thank you. And we are actually out of questions and at time. So perfect timing. Um, I want to thank you both again for, for being so generous with us today, for sharing your insights. The compliments have continued to pour in the chat. So please do get a, have, a, have a look at um, those before you have to leave. Um, but please, we have about a five minute break now. So feel free to get up, stretch your legs, um, have some water. Uh, but we hope to see you all back here soon for the rest of our program. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This was great. Thank you, everyone. And we really appreciate it.